Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back uh, after a short break. Um, my name is Ashley Kwaku. I'm the executive director of the Election Trust Initiative. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization that works with election officials, with researchers, policymakers, and nonprofits to support the field of election administration. Um, and in particular, um, we're focused on how we can strengthen the infrastructure that supports election officials in their critical work of securing um, and safeguarding our elections. Um, I'm really uh, delighted to be here. Um, thanks to the, the Humphrey School for um, inviting me to participate in this conversation. Um, and particularly, I'm delighted to, to facilitate this discussion on state associations, which I think um, we've all um, come to understand through the course of this morning's uh, discussions um, are a critical piece of this uh, field infrastructure for uh, election administration. Um, there are state associations of election officials in most states. I think about 47 states have them. Um, but they uh, vary significantly, I think, as we heard from Tammy Patrick earlier in terms of their structure, their capacity, um, their resources, and their, uh, and their impact. Um, and so we have the opportunity today, I think, to hear from um, three leaders of some of the most uh, well-established uh, state associations. Um, and through their experiences, we can really see the power that the, these structures um, have in terms of supporting election officials and supporting their work. And I think after the, the sessions this morning, we need some, some good um, stories about what we can do to lift up uh, the sort of beleaguered state of our election official cadre. Um, but we've heard about uh, state associations as this vital connective tissue across their members, the work they do in terms of um, professionalization and training for the workforce, the work that they do on policy uh, and advocacy, uh, the, 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 the spaces that they uh, create for sharing of resources and tools. Um, and so I think it'd be, we'll, we'll have a wonderful uh, opportunity to have a conversation with three um, leaders today who can help us understand how these associations work, why they're able to be as successful as they are in terms of supporting the professionalization of the uh, election workforce. Um, so very quickly, um, we have uh, at the far end of my, uh, to my left is Matt Crane, who is the executive director of the Colorado County Clerks Association. Um, next to Matt, we have Amy uh, Farrington, who is the ex executive director of the Florida Supervisor of Elections. And then up on the screen, we have Sherry Poland, from the, uh, who's president of the Ohio Association of Election Officials. So thanks to all of you for participating and, and welcome to the conversation. Um, just a reminder, um, if you're joining, please um, do uh, submit questions on the chat or, um, or in the room. We'll have some chance for Q&A uh, at, uh, at the end of these initial uh, comments. Um, so Sherry, um, I'd love to start with you if I could. Um, uh, tell us a bit about the Ohio Association of Election Officials. What are the features that make it strong and effective and also how you're approaching the professional development of your members? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm honored to virtually be here uh, with all of you today. I apologize for not being able to appear in person as we just held an election last week in Ohio, uh, so we're now working towards certification. I'd like to begin by describing the bipartisan structure of boards of elections in the state of Ohio. Uh, every county in the state has a board of elections. The secretary of state is the chief elections official in the state. The members of the county board of elections are appointed by the secretary of state, and each county's board of elections has four members. Two are members of the local Democratic Party, and two are members of the local Republican Party. Each board then appoints a director and a deputy director who are also of opposite political parties, along with a full-time staff and a seasonal staff. The director and deputy director are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the board, and each board is responsible for all local, state, and federal elections that occur within their county. The Ohio Association of Elections Officials is also a bipartisan organization, also known as the OAEO, because we know we all love our acronyms in the world of elections. 
Um, the OAO was formed in 1949. So we will proudly celebrate our 75th anniversary next year. The OAO represents Ohio's 88 county boards of elections and their staff members. Uh, our mission is to promote, to promote fair, accurate, and reliable elections through the education of our members, advocating for sound election policies, and communicating accurate information regarding the administration of elections. How do we accomplish this mission? Well, it really begins with a welcome packet that is sent to all newly appointed election officials, basically introducing them to the association and our various programs. We offer a uh, two-day annual conference um, every January of each year, featuring educational sessions, guest speakers, um, and the opportunity, of course, to network. Uh, the OAO also hosts one-day regional meetings during the summer months. Uh, our members are actually divided into five different regions. Uh, we find that there's sort of just natural similarities in partnerships uh, that tend to arise within geographical uh, regions. We also have a mentorship program. We've partnered with the Ohio Secretary of State to develop peer-to-peer -peer relationships among newly appointed election officials um, and sort of match them with uh, more experienced election officials so they can uh, share best practices with them. The OAO also partnered uh, with the Ohio State University to develop a continuing education and professional development program that is called the Ohio Registered Election Official Program. Uh, for the most part, the courses are co-taught uh, between OSU professors and experienced election administrators. Uh, there's eight courses that are required for certification. Um, and we offer those courses sort of a combination of some are online, some are in person, but we offer them in conjunction with our winter conference and then also the Secretary of State summer conference. So election officials could complete certification within two years. Uh, after certification, election officials have the opportunity um, to take advanced learning courses, um, and they are required to take at least one graduate course every three years in order to uh, maintain their certification. Um, this program has been extremely popular. Um, out of 77 of uh, the 88 counties in Ohio have participated in at least one course um, over the last four years. So, and in addition to these programs, the OEO also lobbies, as I mentioned before, for sound election policy. And we actually have a strong voice uh, in the General Assembly in Ohio. In 2011, the association took the wise step of hiring an executive director, um, Aaron Ackerman, who's still our executive director today. And Director Ackerman guides the association through all of those programs that I mentioned before. And then he also lobbies the state legislature on behalf of the association. He's been an incredible asset to the OAL. And uh, I would highly recommend associations hire an executive director, um, especially such an effective director as, as Aaron has been. Um, as I mentioned earlier, just as the local boards of elections are bipartisan organizations, um, bipartisanship is really the cornerstone of the OAO. We are governed by a board of trustees that consists of 20 members, 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans. Our leadership um, alternates every other year um, be between a Democrat and a Republican serving as president and first vice president. Our committees all have equal representation amongst the two uh, political parties. Um, I think that, you know, it's often said in Ohio that boards of elections are a place where Democrats and Republicans still come together to do the people's work. And that's no different um, in our association. And yes, it is challenging at times, but I also think um, our bipartisan makeup um, has led to so many of our successes. Uh, in addition to the robust educational programs we've created, 
you know, we have effectively lobbied for sensible election policies. And I think a lot of that has to do, again, with our bar bipartisan nature. When we come to the General Assembly, we're able to say, this is the recommendation of your bipartisan election officials. Um, just to name a few of some of our successes that we've lobbied for is online voter registration, um, the funding for our inaugural rollout of electronic poll books. Um, we were able to change in-person early voting laws in Ohio to mirror that of in-person voting on election day, um, which made the process much quicker, easier for voters, and really took um, a lesson, some of the burden for election officials. Uh, we uh, proactively secured funding to upgrade our, our voting equipment and voting systems um, prior to the 2020 presidential election. Again, this is all state funded. There, I shouldn't say it's all. Um, the, the counties did bear some of the expense, but, but the state did provide the majority of the funding. And then we um, just recently, just this year, uh, secured additional funding to upgrade our electronic poll book. So, I am very grateful to those who came before me in the association and those that I currently serve with to build such a strong association. Um, you know, the benefits to election administration have been many. Just to summarize, you know, we are a clearinghouse for sharing of best practices, news, developments. Um, we represent the election officials' interests to our state legislature. We administer comprehensive and convenient training programs, and we promote a sense of community um, that is so needed within a profession that's come under so much uh, tremendous pressure that's been discussed earlier here today. So for all of those reasons, I um, encourage states to uh, form strong associations, and I'll be happy to answer any questions once we get to that point in the program. Thank you so much. Uh, for that really comprehensive overview of Ohio. And I think we can all see from um, all of the aspects that Sherry mentioned about the executive director, the bipartisanship sort of core features of this association that's helped it be so successful. So thank you for that. Um, Amy, I'd love to, to talk about Florida a bit because you also have um, a very well-established um, uh, training and certification um, program. So can you tell us a bit about your association, how you support your members and, and about your, your training program? Sure, thank you. And I, I'll say, just listening to Sherry, a lot of those things that she was saying, I was thinking, oh, we do that too, we do that too. So you'll see trends, I think, in, in the associations like you know that work for everybody and some things just work for some states. And so that's an important part, I think, of election anywhere is to share the ideas um, and reach out and see what you like about what others are doing. So in Florida, uh, we have the Florida Supervisors of Elections. It's a 501c6. It was incorporated in 1964. So we are celebrating our 60th year next year during the 2024 election cycle. Um, but I think it was in about 2000 that supervisors in, in Florida found a real need to strengthen and professionalize what they do. I mean, they still had something before then, of course, but that was when I think it really started um, to take the shape that it is in now. And so to give you an idea in Florida, we have 67 counties. They range from registered voters from 4,400 to 1.5 million in Miami-Dade. Um, so we, just like everybody else, I think all the other states, we have like the little rural ones that have like one person working in the office. And we have Miami-Dade that has, you know, probably hundreds working in their office. Um, and geographically, we're just as challenged as every other state in Monroe County, which is where the keys are at. It takes them three hours to get from one end of the county to the other. Um, and so you can imagine for election day, some of the logistical challenges that that brings. Um, are the structure of our organization, um, we have elected officers. They're elected by the members of the association. Our members are our 67 supervisors of elections. They are elected in Florida. Um, they run, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, all of the elections, but that's what they do. They don't do the recording that others do. They don't do some of that other stuff. They do everything from voter registration straight through, you know, audit certification. Um, so we have six officers that are elected by their members. Generally, they progress through. So if you start as treasurer, you'll be, you know, secretary, you'll be by, so the, by the time you're president, um, you have a really good idea of how the association works and what the needs are. And there's that consistency, I think. Um, over time, which is really important. Um, and then we hang on to them one more year. We have a past president that we make <laughs> hang out with us for a little bit longer because they're a real good um, source of information um, having gone through everything. 
because it can be a difficult position to be an officer in these organizations. It's a lot of work at times. Um, so followed by that, we have a board of directors. We have 10 members of our board of directors. They are um, broken out by region. So we have 10 districts in the state of Florida um, and they select their own board of directors. So that's who's representing their region. Um, and beyond that, we have you know, standing committees that are appointed by the president. We have um, special committees if we need it. One of the unique things that, that we do that I, I think is very effective is we have county working groups. And so we break counties up by um, registered voters. And so small counties get together, you know, a couple times a year and they talk about the particular issues that they are having and medium and large counties because it can be different. But it's important that they all come in the room at the same time, you know, a couple times a year as well, because a lot of them, you know, we're all facing the same um, challenges. Our legislature just ended on Friday. And so we're still working through some of that. And no matter if you're a small county or a big county, if, you know, vote by mail changes, well, everybody has to change it. And so we'll work through that um, as a group. In terms of staff, um, I'm the staff. <laughs> um, I'm uh, actually contracted, so it's not it's not an employee kind of um, position, and that's what it was before me. Um, before me, it ha we had the same executive director who also served as general counsel, um, and then also as lobbyist for a period of time. And then we've since um, started to work with lobbyists, and we still have. Um, him, the um, last executive director on as a general counsel. So the, the nice thing I think you see in elections, um, even though we're talking about people leaving the field is when, when there's that um, history, like people, a lot of people have been in it for a long time. Um, and so that's, that's really helpful to be able to have, you know, this is why we did it that way. And that's why we're going to do it, you know, a different way. Um, kind of going along with what Sherry said in terms of her mission, Florida has really strong core values, and I think they hold true to it every meeting they have, every discussion they have, and they focus around ethics, integrity, professionalism, and communication. We have a really strong ethics program. Um, some of it's required by the state, um, but it's in all of our core values. It's in even our um, certification program. It's in their core values. You may not have seen it um, on the slide, but one of the 30 courses that we, courses that we teach is on ethics. Um, and so I think that that's um, really important to continue um, that in, in terms of a level of professionalism. Um, so when, when I was asked to come do this and then Ashley sent out some questions, I actually asked the members, you know, what do you, th why is Florida successful? Like why have, first of all, we've been around a long time, which is helpful, but um, why do we do it so well? And, and um, what has, have Florida supervisors of elections added to the industry in terms of professionalism. Um, and so lots of feedback back. Um, one of the key things that they talked about, and Sherry talked about it a little bit too, is as soon as a supervisor is elected, um, we do a new supervisor orientation. We set them up with a mentor. We bring them along. Um, a lot of times it is staff that have come up through the ranks that run for the office and, um, you know, step up into supervisor. That's a very different role than what they would have been in staff. And so we make sure that they have the support and the information that they need um, to start out successfully. Um, beyond that, we do have the, yeah, you guys have all heard about it today, we have the Florida Certified Elections Professional um, Program that we started talking about in 2005. We worked with a local university um, in Southwest Florida, the Florida Gulf Coast University at the time to get it started. It took four years to get it off the ground. Um, they did a lot of research, what would be needed, what is it going to look like. A lot of our supervisors of elections are SARA certified, um, which is a wonderful program. And so this is kind of a supplement to that for Florida. And so it's Florida centric. Um, it's a little more broad based in terms of being able to send staff. Um, right now we have, I think, 841 participants that have either gone through or are in it. Um, 254 have graduated. Um, we do require recertification on an annual basis. And so they have, you know, uh, um, courses that they can choose from and we add to new ones this year. I think we're going to do one on uh, the legislative process. Um, so now in order to do that, we moved from FGCU to Florida State University. So we do have a really strong partnership with the Florida Institute of Government at FSU, um, all those acronyms. Um, and so they help us put on this program and make sure the learning objectives are what they need to be to make sure that the speakers are the level that we need them to be at. Um, and so it's been a really great partnership. Um, we get a lot of feedback from participants on what they, we did a focus group at the 10-year anniversary on what they found useful. Like we can think about what we find useful, but what, what are they really finding out? And so 
those focus groups came back to say that it gave them a really good um, idea of the big picture of elections because a lot of times in offices, depending on what you are, if you're a little county, you know the big picture because you do every single thing. But you know, if you just did voter registration, sometimes you don't know why vote by mail is what it is. And so I think it gives them a bigger sense of uh, team and a bigger idea of the picture of elections. Uh, quite a few of them said it gave them a, a better sense of pride in the work that they do um, and then the work that their team uh, members do. And then one of the things, and we've talked about this quite a lot, community and networking, and it gives them um, strength, it strengthens their relationships outside the office. So they can, if they work in vote by mail, they have their peers that work in vote by mail that they can call and ask questions about or, or that don't work in vote by mail that they can still call and touch base with. And so I think it gives them a sense of being a larger team than just as in their office. And um, sorry, I have to have notes. <laughs> um, so so uh, I think that's it for Florida in terms of, I said, how many graduates we have. And so that's been a really successful program. We're currently looking at how to better reach more people. We're doing regional workshops for them, but we also do all similar things like what Sherry was talking about, you know, conferences and regional workshops. And we're starting starting to do more online kind of workshops, things that people just can't quite get there in person, but for a one hour, you know, something kind of cybersecurity update, like sometimes we'll just jump on and do something like that. So um, that's what we're looking to do um, in the near future. Great. Thank you so much, um, Amy. And I think, you know, your comments really, I think, helped us kind of remember some of what we heard this morning about how uh, election officials not only need the skills-based uh, uh, information in terms of training, but they need this I forget how uh, Weber University described it, the soul or the emotional and mental um, uh, support. And I think you're really articulating both what they're getting in terms of the certification, but then what they get from their peers in terms of that um, that support of just having someone who's walking the road along with you and who knows what you're dealing with, um, uh, you know, on, on a whole variety of issues. So that's that's great. Um, Matt, we'd love to hear as well about, about Colorado. We had a little bit of bragging from from Judd earlier about how great the Colorado Association is and how how effective you are more effective than than him it turns out um, and so really interested to hear how you see your association having in, uh, in most impact for its members and I think also you have a unique perspective on how members um, look at professionalization from a variety of perspectives even in, in, in terms of holding each other accountable. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thanks to Larry and Judd for the invitation to, to be here today. Um, this is such an important conversation. And I think, especially since 2020, we've really seen how associations can really help fill the gap um, for some of the craziness that's that's happened. Um, so I was feeling really good about um, representing my association here. I thought we were doing really well. We were we are 54 years old, and I come to find out I'm the baby in the group. So um um, that's the, it's very cool though, but I think w one of the things that's important too is with all three associations, there is a long history of demonstrated cooperation and bipartisanship, nonpartisanship, and the approach to this. And I, I think that's something that I hear from Sherry and Amy is you know that is so important in terms of having um, a good association and more importantly an effective association in terms of its supporting its members, whether it's through education or legislation, uh, communication, you know, across the board. So very much like my colleagues um, in Ohio and Florida, we have um, we we have an executive director. We started, I think, in 2009 with an executive director. We were very fortunate that Danetta Davidson. So for those of you who've been around for a long time, um, she's pretty much a a goddess in ele in the election world. Um, she was former Secretary of State, clerk in two counties former EAC commissioner. Um, so she was our first executive director. And then um, the amazing Pam Anderson uh, followed Danetta. And then I'm our, I'm our third uh, executive director. So I have huge shoes to fill, uh, to say the very least. Um, we also have two other contract employees. We have a lobbyist that, that works for us. And then we have somebody that helps us with conference support. So our, we really focus on um, a lot of the same things Education and training, first and foremost, of our uh, of our members. Um, that's first and foremost. We're a little bit different than Ohio and Florida. In Colorado, the certification program is actually uh, run by the state, by Judd and his team, and they do a fantastic job. Um, I will say, and I'll probably say this a lot through the presentation today. One of the things that helps make us so successful, and you know, our association does um, get a lot of credit. 
Um, but it really is because we have a great relationship with our friends um, at the state. And I think, you know, we have, we have a core group that's been there for a long time, whether at the state level or at the county level. Elected officials come and go. We all know that. Um, but it's the staff, the cadre of staff that's been there for a long time. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I worked my way up, like you said, a lot of your members where I was worked my way up as staff then became the elected clerk in Arapahoe. And, you know, I can tell you whether I was elected or staff, junior staff, my relationship with Judd was always the same, always very direct. We agree sometimes, we disagree sometimes, but always friends. Um, and always we know that we have um, the same approach to making sure that we run accessible and secure elections. And so that's that's a big part of what makes us successful. Um, we have two conferences a year. We have a winter and a summer conference for all of our members. Um, and then much like my colleagues, our, our state is broken up into four different regions. So those regions will also meet twice a year. So there's a lot of chance for us to connect as a group and then in the regions. The regions tend to be based on size. Um, you know, you know, in Colorado, most of our our larger jurisdictions are right in the center in our central region. Um, the rest of the the rest of our regions, it's mostly rural. Um, we do a great job of staying nonpartisan. Although there will be flare ups from time to time, uh, and we allow people their space to do that. We also see um, divides between rural and urban areas too, in terms of what they need and how prescriptive they want the law to be. We tend to see um, in the urban areas, um, you know, those folks want more prescription in the law, whereas in the rural areas, they're like, we know how to do our jobs and let us do it. This is what the people elected us to do. So there's always that uh, that kind of friction. But for the most part, everybody's able to come together and move forward on things that we can all agree on. I think, you know, one of the things we've heard a lot, the importance of these uh, of associations is the connectivity that it provides to its members, you know, coming through COVID in 2020 where we didn't have a chance to get together. And it also coincided with, you know, perhaps the most challenging election um, that, that we've seen, not being able to get together in person with your colleagues um, and be able to talk about best practices or just quite frankly, sit at the bar and talk about the crazy that happened. Um, that was something that was really missing. And so, you know, now that we're back in full swing, I think that's a great, that's a great thing to be able to do. The other thing we've started doing since 2020, um, and I know this is common throughout the country, is you'll say, okay, well, I know, well, I'll have election officials in my state say, I know in Colorado, we're good, but man, what happened in Georgia? Or holy moly, what is going on in Maricopa? Um, and so the first thing I try to remind people is, first of all, don't criticize an election official when you know nothing about their processes or anything like that. You hate when people do that to you. So have the respect um, to your colleagues across the country. But one of the things we've tried to do then at our conferences is start what we've called what we call our election hero series. Um, so where um, last summer we brought in Bill Gates from Maricopa so that election officials could hear directly from the source what happened in Maricopa. Um, and it was, a Bill was fantastic. It was an incredibly moving presentation. There were laughs, there were tears. I mean, it was, it was just incredible. This summer, we're really excited. We have Gabe Sterling uh, from Georgia coming in and then Secretary Benson from Michigan coming in because it's so important not just to build a connectivity in state, but with our colleagues across the country too, to create those relationships, right? So if something comes up, um, I know, you know, one of uh, one of my dear friends, she worked for me in Arapahoe, she's in Mesa County now, um, Stephanie Winholtz, you know, she has formed a relationship with Bill. Well, they keep in touch now because, you know, they, you know, they created and they, you know, they were able to bond at our conference over very difficult circumstances. So I think that's important to help people learn and grow, um, not just in our states, but across the country. As Judd mentioned, we do a lot with legislative adv advocacy. Um, you know, it, like with all of you, sometimes it's playing offense, sometimes it's playing defense. Um, you know, examples of where we've been effective playing offense, I think back in 2013 with our House Bill 1303, which, um, you know, the the initial bill was to do same day voter registration and precinct polling places. And the association leadership at the time stepped in and said, okay, that's going to be untenable, but let's see what we can do. And that's how we came up with our mail ballot delivery model, same day voter registration with vote centers. So it was through the advocacy of the clerks association that we were able to come up, uh, come up with that model. I think just this year we've, we've passed a bill that's modernized the way that we fund our elections where, you know, before this year, the state reimbursed counties about 20%. Um, of the election cost, and we were able to move that forward to 45%. 
of election costs. Um, so we can be very effective, especially when we're all behind uh, the costs. Um, and then sometimes it is playing defense, right? Whether it's somebody trying to say we should go back to the Stone Age and you know throw stones in jars uh, to be able to count ballots. So there's always work, always offense and defense. But the great thing is when people are moving uniformly together, it makes that fight a lot easier. Communication support, we provide a lot of communication support to our folks, um, which was really important after 2020. And again, what was happening, not just in other parts of the country, but in certain counties in Colorado, Judd alluded to this before, but we've, you know, we had the, un the unfortunate election security breach in Mesa County um, with the clerk there. So being able to provide communication support to our folks, what is happening? What do you guys need to know? Of course, you know, once you have one, that does something unethical, potentially uh, illegal, um, certainly violating their oath. There's gonna be pressure on other clerks to do the same thing. I know so many of you know what I'm talking about with that. So it was important to be a backstop, provide information um, to our folks, allow them to call in and say, hey, what's happening? What can we do? What happened here? What did she do here? Um, so we were able to gather that information, get talking points out on a regular basis about what we were going on and what we were hearing. And I think we were effective at that, quite frankly, because um, in some of the chatter we saw online, I don't think they expected the type of um, resistance that they got from clerks, and a lot of it was because of the work of the executive board at the association pushing back, uh, pushing back on that to the point where they started, as Judd said, they started finding other ways to try to get changes they want. When they found they couldn't lean on clerks, they started going to the Board of County Commissioners to try to mess with contracts. So one of the things we did last year, we partnered with uh, Judd and his team and the secretary and her team and passed a bill that said, you know, you have to use uh, electric, uh, voting uh, equipment to be able to tabulate votes. Um, so we're um, we're able to be very agile as well, which helps us be super effective. Um, and then there's things where we try to really focus on improvement. One of the things after 2020 that just drove everybody nuts was when somebody would go to them and say, oh, you have a Kraken in your voting system. And we have an election official that says, no, that's not true. And this is why, and they go through all the reasons. Um, the, uh, you know, That person would go out and say, oh, I went to the clerks. And they say, there's nothing to see here. Um, and they don't care about election integrity. So we, we were more aggressive after 2020 um, in coming up with an agenda around election integrity and being very vocal about it, going to the media about it, um, doing that, things like um, new improving our signature verification audits, looking at voter registration audits. Um, the funding was a, was a big piece. Ultimately, we'd, uh, the group decided we'd like to put cast vote records um, and ballot images online for free after each election. I know that's Matt Masterson's favorite piece to that one. Um, so, but we were very aggressive. So we formed a committee around that with election experts in the state, um, including Judd um, and some national folks, including Jen, including Matt to come together to talk about best practices to be able to get this done. Um, and then the other thing we're looking at, so after, you know, the Tina Peters disgrace um, and the fiasco in Mesa County and the pressure that got put on our folks. One of the things that we're looking at is how can we better protect our election officials um, and, and give them the tools that they need. And part of that has to come with voter education and outreach too. So it's not just the communication that we're doing internally with our members but it's what we're trying to push out externally to voters in Colorado. One of the things that we are looking at trying to, um, we're in the very early stages of it, but trying to get off the ground is, you know, we've talked about the certification program that we do for election officials. Well, we would love to have a certification program for the public. So the idea behind this is to educate voters about what we do. If they sign up, part of it will be classwork. We'd like to have online components to it. Part of it will be taking a tour of your election facility, um, serving as an election judge, all of these things to help build a better awareness about what really happens in our elections. The idea as well as, you know, to incentivize it, if you go through this, you can potentially get a higher wage as an election judge, right? But really try to um, go out and spread the gospel about what we do, um, you know, in elections, why our elections are good. Um, where we have room to improve and just be open and honest in that with that. But it has to be more going out, an aggressive move out into the public. Um, and, you know, our members think that we are um, suited well to be able to go out and do that. And having the association behind it, behind it 
we'll give it more um, resources, access to materials, all that kind of thing. So kind of a basic high overview of um, of where we're at. Um, sounds like we're very similar to uh, uh, to Ohio and Florida. So happy to take any questions and thank you for the opportunity to, re to be here. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to all of the panelists. I think, you know, the three of them make it kind of look easy in the sense of all of the things that they're providing to their members. But as I sort of said at the top, um, most, you know, even though most states have an association, very few of them are doing what you're what you're doing. I'm curious, you know, how would what advice would you give to the um, more nascent, smaller, less developed, um, you know, peers of yours um, around the country? And I think that one question I think I'm going to add to this is, um, how, especially because you have this uh, decades long. Um, uh, history and a history of bipartisanship, it sounds like in, in all cases. Um, how do you think about um, an association that is looking to build that kind of cooperation in the kind of partisan environment that we find ourselves in today? Anybody who wants to jump in? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the advice, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but the advice that I would give is, I mean, when we go around and see these things and see what other people are doing, I mean, often, like I wrote down a couple of ideas from Matt that I'll take back and see, you know, kind of talk to our members about it. But I think one of the um, things that I would suggest is for those that, that you know, have an association or are looking to take it to the next step is, you know, reach out to associations that are where you want to be or, you know, a couple steps ahead of where you are, because we're happy to share. I mean, I get calls all the time about our new um, supervisor orientation, and I'm happy to share that information. Um, the other thing, I, I think that one of the reasons FSE has been really um, successful is they have focused on their core values throughout, and they define those early on, and they hold true to them no matter what they're doing. And so I think that that's really important to define, like, who who, who do you want to be when you grow up, um, and, and put some words to the paper. So I think that would be helpful. The other thing I would say is that for um, Florida our members really run the organization. Like I'm, I'm happy to be there and help shepherd everything along and implement the policies that they want, but there's ownership in this. And they, this is their association. They created it. They've made it what, what it is. And I think that that's a big um, part of it. Cause for us, it's voluntary. No, you, nobody has to join there. You can, you can, if you want. And, but we, we have almost always had all 67 there. So I think that that's been a really important part of it is that I, I'm not convincing anybody to do anything like there. The, I'm, I'm trying to hold them back because it's so much stuff going on. But um, I think that's a, an important part of it. And the other thing is to have a plan. Like, I think it takes time um, to think about where FSC was before the 2000 election and then where they were, you know, five, 10 now later. Um, it, it has taken a bit of time and planning. Okay. No? I think I think that's right. I think another factor with it um, is patience because it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take, it's going to take some time. But I think when you, when you look at models that have been successful, um, you know, there's no question that the juice is worth the squeeze in terms of putting in the time to get it done. And it can be very hard, especially for rural and smaller counties, because as we've heard so many times today, they don't have the resources. They have made, they have a few people in the office, but I think when they see that, um, it really expands their access to uh, personnel support because we have counties all the time say, oh my gosh, I'm in a backlog in motor vehicle. Can you send people down? Absolutely, we'll send them down. Um, so you can provide personnel support um, and all kinds of other support, whether it's another eye to look at statute or to try to figure out what this means. Um, so I think it really, it, it is patience, but it has to be a shared commitment, mm -hmm. you know, as Amy was saying to certain fundamental principles, which are, you know, bipartisanship, you have to give people space to be who they are, allow for disagreement. But at the end of the day, this is who we are. You have your mission statement, whatever that is, this is what we're always going to come back to. And then we can go out and do a lot more things together than we can individually. And I think that's the thing, even when we have some people who are frustrated, because let's say they want, a, a, you know, a certain thing, at, you know, done at the legislature, and there's just no appetite to have that happen. And they're like, well, why am I doing this? And then you stop and realize, okay, well, I didn't get this one piece, but look at this long yeah. list of other things. I never would have gotten without this joint commitment to move forward together. Um, so I just, yeah, patience and, you know, um, a commitment to what you're trying to do. Um, I think that's where it's at. 
Sherry, anything additionally to add? Oh, I wholeheartedly agree with both Amy and Matt um, on their comments. I, I think another suggestion I would throw out is perhaps getting together a, a small committee of, of your membership um, and just sort of work through and try to determine what your mission statement would be. And then, as Amy mentioned, lay out the plan for how you're going to obtain that. I know that we've in the past have had retreats with our trustees um, where we've redefined our mission statement, where we've reviewed and updated our bylaws. And I think that has been really helpful um, because if you go someplace, you know, separate, get out of your office, you know, away from all other distractions where you can really devote um, the time. And it also just helps to form that camaraderie that that's, that's so, so important. Great, thank you so much. I'm wondering, um, we, you know, going back to the earlier uh, conversation about training and certification, um, and we've heard a lot about the role that associations can play. How do you see uh, your association interfacing with other entities in terms of this professionalization? In terms of the state office, um, the the university, um, other other parts of that ecosystem. How does your uh, your work as an association interface with with that broader ecosystem? I can, yeah, I can go ahead. start with that one. Sure. Um, again, you know, in Colorado, the state handles a lot of that. Uh, they handle the entire certification program. But again, where we have a strong relationship, there is always an open dialogue back and forth um, where we talk about ideas about how to improve what other topics we need to take on. I think where we were effective at impact, impacting the certification was actually just last year in our legislative session. It was after the uh, the security breach in Mesa County. And as Jed alluded to, we had a clerk who never took the time to learn the job, learn the systems, um, you know, was, you know, I think she was elected thinking she was winning a beauty pageant as opposed to being a leader and somebody who was uh, a serious policymaker. But one of the things that became apparent was Colorado had a requirement that you had to get your certification within two years. And uh, it was important from my members that the public hear from us that we don't stand behind what happened and that, you know, we wanted to make sure we were holding ourselves accountable. And so part of the bill that we ran last year um, with the secretary, with Judd and their team was we advocated to move that certification requirement up from two years to six months. Um, so because we felt before you could do your job, you should know your job. And unfortunately, we had a bad apple who proved that to be true. So that's, you know, so whether it's liaising with the state on what that program looks like or working through the legislature to make sure that it's meeting the needs of our members and more importantly, our voters, um, there's, lot, there's lots of different ways the association can help facilitate that. Yeah, I would, I would go along the same lines. We have a really good relationship with our division of elections and our Department of State in Florida, we work with them. Um, they don't do our certification, but they they do attend and they do teach some of the courses. And so that's a that's an um, important part of it. And then we do partner, I don't know, partner, but we work with them on legislative issues um, because we do have different points of view. Supervisors are the ones, you know, implementing and running the elections and the division is more policymaker. They do, you know, all the rulemaking and, and all that part of it. So I think that that relationship is an important one. It's always been a strong one. I used to, I used to work at the state and it kind of, it was all flipped, but, um, you know, those are the election experts in the state, the supervisors and their staff, and then the division. So I think that's really important. And then in terms of partnering outside of elections, you know, kind of people, I think it, the certification programs have been really helpful in bringing like universities in and kind of this different viewpoint. When we have conferences, we do have, you know, academics come in and talk about, you know, statistics and kind of explain to us like what the voting trends are. And so I think it's important to think outside of perhaps the logistics um, on elections. And there's lots of partners that are willing to come in and, and be a part of that. Yeah. Sherry, any thoughts on your end? Uh, yeah, I'll just add through our partnership with Ohio State University, we were able to develop core classes that were Ohio specific. So I think that was a tremendous help. Um, not to say we, we definitely have other advanced learning opportunities to cover other subjects outside of elections, um, but that was definitely a benefit of, of partnering with Ohio State. The other is, um, you know, when COVID hit and we could no longer hold these classes in person, Ohio State was instrumental in helping us get those courses online. And now um, being able to offer more of a hybrid system where we have both in-person and online 
it's really increased um, the number of election officials that are participating in the program. Um, you know, not all election officials can can get away for the day, and just it, the cost of travel um, is is sometimes difficult. And so, being able to offer online um, is definitely been a benefit. What? Um... How do you guys think that um, state associations can help um, connect um, members, especially in these smaller or more remote jurisdictions, with some of the, the, the bigger federal or other kinds of national resources? You guys have this unique um, uh, uh, position in being able to be almost like a last mile um, entity, right? You can you can reach down to to the locals in ways that maybe big um, federal agencies um, uh, always can't. So, how do you see uh, yourselves uh, performing that function, especially when it comes to, you know, something like a HAVA grant program or cybersecurity assessments or other kinds of resources that exist at the national level? I know men going first on this one. Um, well, I think uh, something that was recently created, you know, is the AAC's local leadership council, right? Where each state now has two uh, representatives on that council. And I, I currently serve as well as the past president of the Ohio Association of Election Officials. So um, it's a funneling of information because we're serving on that council, so we're receiving information regarding, um, you know, different programs, grants, um, different tools for elections, uh, officials that are offered through the EAC, and just being able to funnel that and share that down um, to the local county level. I think something else that we've done is we have several committees. As I mentioned before, we were governed by a board of trustees. We also have a pretty large legislative committee made up of four, 40 members. And we try to make sure that our committees are diverse, you know, as far as small, medium, and large counties, as far as their roles as board members, directors, deputy directors, um, and then also from um, geographically throughout the state. So we just try to make sure that we have very diverse uh, committees. Great. Other thoughts, Matt? Sure, I think um, I think another area for this again becomes advocacy. So, you know, as you said, these these folks that make up our last mile, they have so many things. They're actually on the counter doing a voter registration or issuing a a driver's license or you know recording a marriage license. They're they're the ones doing the work. Much different than my experience um, or larger counties experience, um, where it's more the it's solely more of an executive role. Um, I think the advocacy part, though, is important. So one is making sure that we get information down to them, keeping that connective um, tissue strong. But I think, you know, some of the, I'm thinking about this right now, actually, you know, Judd and I, uh, Mutual Admiration Society, we do a lot together. But right now, we're tag teaming um, part of the federal government because the grant process is not clear. Um, and so if, you know, if you say you have a grant out there, but it's not accessible or easy for people to find, it's not really accessible. Um, so that's one of the things that we can try to do from these positions as well is work with our federal partners to try to streamline that process or at least find the information and then put it in a package that's uh, super easy for, for our folks to consume so they don't have to spend a lot of time searching on a, on a terrible federal website where they can't find any links to anything. We can consolidate that and give it to our folks. Yeah, good. So I would go along the same lines in terms of serving as kind of that hub for communications and information sharing. Um, every supervisor gets the same email from me, whether you're a small county or a big county. So everybody is getting the same information. Um, we do also, like Sherry said, on our committees, we're careful to put small, medium, and large on all the different committees, um, partly for their involvement, but also their viewpoints are very important. Um, on the different areas. Um, we do do a, a lot with grants and trying to explain what this grant is and it, on the state level too, not just federal. But then the other thing I think is really beneficial is a lot of our members are on the boards of these federal organizations. Like um, here's all the acronyms and I do not know what they all stand for. Like EI, ISAC, um, we have quite a few on that one. Um, one of ours was, I think the chair of the election center for um, a while. Um, one of the current EAC commissioners was our division um, of elections director. So we have some of these contacts and, and they, you know, bring back the information and share it. They invite their friends from these organizations to come speak at conferences and things like that. So I, I think that um, and just involving them in all of it, because it's all relevant to everybody. 
Yeah, that's great. It's such a, a real important kind of connective tissue between big national entities and, and, and locals. Um, one last final question is, um, you know, how do you think or, um, you know, sort of the state association uh, of election officials um, compares to or what could it possibly learn, if anything, from other kinds of associations of local public officials? Um, we heard um, Tammy um, uh, Patrick earlier talked about sheriffs associations and the the way that they are um, that they uh, you know advocate for for uh, uh, higher paying dues and they're able to sort of provide more support from their members. I'm just wondering, do you have you seen across um, government in your uh, in your uh, respective areas um, other things that state associations in the election space could learn from how other sectors are um, are supporting their members? So I don't know that this is quite, this is not answering your question, but it just made me think of one of the things that's really a benefit is when you do have relationships with these other organizations in your state. So when something comes up and we're going to have to do something new with the clerk's office, you know, we can reach out to the organization and kind of, you know, talk on that level of all the members and how it's going to affect everybody. And so I think that, um, I don't know if that's necessarily learning from them, but I think that's an important part of it is that they have the same kind of benefits that we have just in, a, in different silos. And so I think it's, um, and you and you can learn. Like some sometimes we you know see you know event ideas or where they're having something and we steal it. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? No, I think that's right. You always strive. I think one of the things too I would bet about all three of our associations is you're always striving to improve. Um, you never want to be the same very long. You always want to move forward. It gets too boring otherwise, and you're not effective for your members. Um, so it is taking a look at what others do and seeing if you can incorporate it. Um, you know, like Amy said, I've been writing down notes uh, <laughs> from their presentations too. Like, I can't wait to connect after this to be like, hey, can you send me this? Um, it really is, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with taking somebody's idea and bringing it there and maybe you make it a little better and they come back around and say, hey, I'm gonna, I love how you built on that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the fun part of the job. Yeah, that's, that's what's fun. Sherry, last word from you. I'll just sort of echo everything Amy and Matt just said. I know we have a subcommittee that um, works with the County Commissioners Association because, you know, they, in Ohio, they fund elections. So it's very helpful when we can team up together as two joint associations um, to lobby for, for funding for, for boards of elections. Um, but also, like uh, Matt and Amy said, it's definitely just a sharing of ideas and learning from each other. And I've definitely jotted down a lot of notes uh, uh, to take back with me as well. Great. Well, thank you all uh, so much for sharing the experiences of your states. We sort of felt like we, we did a tour of the country a bit and hearing from Ohio, Florida, and Colorado, but very um, interesting, I think, important infrastructure that you guys are, have built and sustained and um, important um, resources that help uh, address the professionalization and retention of our um, beleaguered but very important elections workforce. So thank you all for all, the, all your work and for the conversation. Mm. 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 Yeah.